and a mouthful. I have to say, I'm not going to be saying it repeatedly. I have to, uh, at all. So let's start with you, Lara. Um, tell us a bit about what you do at IT, yes, particularly how you work with Reese. Okay. And then give us a sense, just broad brushstroke, of why it's so important to data-enable television and to make it addressable and more targeted using that data. Sure. So I'm Laura Islan, Director of Data Strategy, as it says behind me. Um, I've been at ITV for about three years. I sit as part of uh, a group um, data strategy function. Um, and uh, my team in particular are responsible for building the data products and capabilities that underpin a lot of what Reese talked about earlier today. So the, the innovations, uh, the data-driven innovations that are available in Planet V through Ad Labs. Um, I'm going to go against the grain uh, of the, the topic a little bit and say that, you know, per, of, I am going to say this because I'm a data person, but I think data um, is important to broadcasters and media owners in general, and in fact, the entire ecosystem, not purely from a targeting perspective, but really what data can bring is, is much broader. It's the insight that, that enables planning, it enables measurement, it enables... Can you, yeah, you can go. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I thought that was... Uh, and I think, um, I think it's all about how we use, in this space, it's all about how we use data to uh, optimize the use of our advertising capacity, right? And that has benefits for all parts of the ecosystem. So what can the data do for a brand to ensure that they're driving better business outcomes with their, from their media investment, better ROI? For media owners, it's about creating commercial opportunity, but also doing that in balance with creating a better user experience for our viewers, you know, we always forget about the viewers in this. And then from a viewer perspective, we want to ensure that they are seeing content, whether that is programming or advertising content that is relevant and it's creating an enhanced experience for them. So I think data has a, has a bigger role to play than just targeting within this ecosystem. Wonderful. Let's jump on. Sam, who are you? What do you do? And why is data so important to the future of television? Sure. So Sam Wilson, um, Vice President of Business Development and Enterprise Sales at Magnite. So working with some of our key publishers uh, across Europe. Um, so the importance of it, um, and I agree with Lara with a lot of those points. I think that you know the, the the data side is key for for targeting, but also you know on a wider base, you've got um, a ton that you can do from a user experience standpoint. Um, so utilizing that data for uh, creating a better UI experience for uh, creating better recommendations for the end users along with uh, uh, targeted advertising. So I think that's great. Um, the addressability I love um, from, a, from the buy side as well. So you've got a, a whole host of new advertisers coming into the market that haven't traditionally been able to advertise on, uh, on TV. Maybe they couldn't afford the upfronts and those kind of areas. So pretty exciting that there's a direct to consumer goods and offerings coming into the market uh, and being able to utilize this more targeted approach on, on the big screen. Um, so yeah. Great. Let's jump straight along. Emmanuel, another innovation lead from another big European <laughs> business. Tell us who you are, what you do, and then give us your view from a Canal Plus perspective of why data-driven targeting is so important. Yes, uh, first of all, hi everyone. So, Emmanuel Godal, I'm, um, uh, I'm a head of uh, digital marketing and innovation at Canal Plus Ad Sales House. So, I, I am with my hat of uh, Ad Sales House at Canal Plus. Uh, for those who do not know us, in fact, Canal Plus is both a broadcaster uh, with a free to air and pay TV uh, channels. And it's also a distributor with uh, our own set of boxes and uh, with uh, over uh, 20, 22 million subscribers all over the world and in France, 9 million uh, subscribers. So with the um, advertising perspective, why it is uh, so, so important for us to, to capitalize on uh, data-driven uh, targeting, I would say that maybe, first of all, uh, to, to compete with uh, digital platforms uh, because they, they, they make a data-driven strategy as the, the core value, as their, their, their core value. And uh, right now, with uh, addressable TV, uh, we can combine all the digital data uh, targeting as well as the, the rich of television and all the brand safe environment. And so now we are, uh, we are able to, to, to have a very strong uh, proposition. The, the other thing why it's so important, it's um, because uh, I think it's a, a very good way for us to uh, attract new advertisers on TV. 
uh, right now, at least in France, um, when we look at the overall advertisers, only 5% only of them advertise on TV. So there is a, a large room for us to attract uh, new advertisers. And, um, and maybe another thing is that what, what, we, what we are seeing is that uh, there, um, there is uh, an increasing part of our clients that want, just as they do in digital, to be able to, to manage and to optimize their TV campaign on their own KPIs and on, on KPIs that are directly connected to their business. And it's very important for, for us to, to meet that, uh, that demand and so to, to provide them with uh, data-driven so solutions. Emmanuel, thank you. This is definitely going to get harder as we get to the end. <laughs> yeah. um, Joe, is there anything that hasn't been said? Yeah. And also, who are you? What do you do? Yeah, I'll start with uh, who I am. So, uh, Joe Kinchin, um, the Partnerships Director for Finecast in the UK. And so, for anyone who's um, in the room who's not that familiar with Finecast, we're an addressable TV platform. And um, we provide brands with a, a single point of access to um, a lot, the largest pool of advanced TV supply within the UK. And then what we can do through an array of our um, data and tech partnerships is layer in different forms of addressability um, to meet the objectives of, of, of those clients. Um, I think we, uh, we have touched on a lot of the benefits. Um, I, would, I, I would wholeheartedly agree on what Lara said, that data does underpin a lot of the infrastructure within, within this landscape, not just targeting. But, um, you know, the... the Kind of the two core ones that we're seeing is traditional TV advertisers needing to keep keep up with their reach points across a fragmenting fragmenting platforms and fragmenting um, audiences, and so um, you know there's the, the, there's real cost gains in working with addressable TV platforms to ensure that, that they they can retain those and we've touched on it and I think Reese touched on it, there is a growing pool of those new to TV, long tail um, advertisers that are, are, are seeing great benefits from being able to enter this premium TV environment, um, but on a localised um, relevant level. And, and just briefly while we're with you, Choreograph, tell us a little bit about Choreograph because WPP now has set up just relatively recently a new data arm. What do Choreograph do and how do you work with it? So that's a very good question, one, and, and one that <laughs> we're, we're still figuring out, and one that we're uncovering at the moment. Right. Um, but um, we will work with them in a number of ways. One of the one of the most exciting ones that I'm working on with now is what they, we can do from a, a dynamic creative uh, perspective and the um, kind of data-driven creative benefits that that they can provide. But essentially, yeah, that that the, they are going to be an underpinning data arm that will empower. And, and elevate everything we do from a targeting perspective, but also everything we can do from a measurement um, and planning perspective as well. Got you, great. Guy, welcome. Sorry about starting early, but I'm glad you made it. <laughs> Tell us a bit about what you do at Liberty and then give us a sense if there's anything left about why this stuff is so important. Sure. Hi everybody, I'm Guy Southam. I work in the advanced advertising team at Liberty Global. Um, we own a number of uh, cable platforms and broadcasters across Europe. Um, and I, yeah, there is not a huge amount to add. I think um, TV, as we all know, is going through an evolution. There's never been more choice in kind of what to watch and how to watch. And I think that in turn has created challenges and opportunities from an advertising perspective. You know, we're seeing some inflation in, in traditional TV audiences in that kind of linear space. And we're also seeing new opportunities, as, as the panel have said, for uh, advertisers who wouldn't have been on TV in the past uh, to access very specific geographical areas or very specific types of users for their products and services. Um, and we use data in all kinds of ways, you know, from a, as a pay TV platform, you know, we, we're looking at optimising that user experience and creating that best possible uh, viewing experience for our customers. Um, as broadcasters, we want to provide the best possible solutions for our advertisers and, you know, in a, in a competitive arms race for content, you know, right. generate the most value from those advertising opportunities. And data's kind of core to all of that. Cool. We've introduced the panel. Let's do a really quick fire defining the terms session. So, Laura, why don't I start with you quickly? Okay. When we think about data driven targeting, TV supports various different kinds. We've got data driven linear, we've got adjustable overlays, 
we've got formats, um, L-shaped formats in HPPTD, these sorts of things. How do you think about the different categories? Can you just rattle through them quickly? So I think from a, with, from a data standpoint, as opposed to kind of an ad tech standpoint, we think about um, the, the, the categories of the, the data in terms of the, the data sources, first right. of all. So uh, viewer data, so what we know about the viewer, um, viewing and behavioral data in terms of what they're doing across the ITV uh, kind of landscape. And then, you know, probably enhanced uh, data capabilities that we get through collaboration with other quality uh, data partners, for example, uh, through clean room technology, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and I think it's worth saying as well, I guess the other spectrum that you can think of is, um, uh, you know, on, on the one end is it's inferred data. So data that we can uh, garner about our, our user base from uh, you know panels and surveys and then on the other hand on the other end it's deterministic data so because we have a pool of logged in users 34 million at last count we we know quite a lot about our user base our viewer base at a deterministic level and then there's and then there's a spectrum in between right so that's where modeling comes in so you can use Panel, panel data um, married with first party deterministic data to create kind of interesting bespoke uh, model segments in between. So it's, I, I'm looking at it slightly yes. different view. No, that makes sense. But, um, but so, that's so, so, so that's a kind of categorization of the data assets we're talking about. Joe, from a fine cast point of view, how do you think about the different targeted video formats? Yeah, sure. So th th there's obviously a lot to un unpick in kind of the addressable or data driven um, lunar scope, but we kind of simplify it for brands in terms of the, 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 the modes of, of addressable TV. Um, you have your, your linear scheduled um, side of things, of which exists the traditional side of, um, and which we target on by broad demo and age um, through, through Barb. Um, but you know, within that mode, there is also the addressable TV or addressable linear. Um, side of things, of which there are um, a number of um, partners that work within that space, and they're typically delivered through well, connected TVs and set-top boxes. Um, but then, I guess the more kind of the, the more traditionally thought of addressable space is the OT OTTV streaming mode, um, and again, that then splits into two, um, of which we have again the more traditional kind of um, video on demand space. Um, of which there are a number of traditional players and um, kind of new players in that space. Um, and also you have what we, we, we determine as live streaming, right. which is still scheduled, but it's just delivered through an IP. And, and really you have kind of three columns there, which we deliver addressable TV across. Great. So that's the format. Let's talk a bit about what we're actually targeting. I, I guess one of the great complexities of television is that we have households, we have individuals within those households. So something like ITV Hub is typically watched by an individual with a registered account. Mm -hmm. And then we also have devices. Sam, how do we navigate between households, people, and devices? Yeah, so on the digital side of things, um, we kind of look at you know, talking to the brands and the agencies about a, a blended approach. So you know, TV is obviously absolutely critical and an amazing experience for branding and, and brand awareness. And then you've got the digital arm, which is maybe a little bit more targeted uh, and the ability to do that. So we actually, uh, not too long ago, ran a campaign with Heineken and we saw 45% of those were digital only users. So as a brand, you have to be there, right? You have to be looking at what you're doing on traditional TV and what you're doing on digital and make sure that you've got the right blend. So we would look and work with advertisers to understand what they're trying to achieve and who their audiences are to kind of make suggestions on that. And is there, I mean, Guy, maybe you want to pick this one up. You're, I'm guessing, mainly focused on the household. Yep. Is there an issue about navigating between household devices and people? Um, I think it's a challenge. I think we we provide a, a new way of targeting users and I think we see a lot of a lot of localized, a lot of geo targeting and I think households, hopefully individuals within that household it's still relevant. Um, but I think you, that's where you need you know an engaged marketing department and an engaged agency to, to look at that kind of blend in terms of making sure you've got the right frequency, you've got the right opportunities to capture the decision maker within that household. I think 
addressability keeps all of the, the brilliant things about TV in terms of you know brand safe, full screen, sound on, all of that good stuff. But it is also the big screen in the living room that we're talking about in terms of the set top box. Yeah. So you, you do have that challenge in terms of, even if you've got a login associated to it, there's no guarantee that when a different person's in the room, they're logging into a different account necessarily. So I think you have to look at your, your frequency and your spacing to try and, to try and hit the, that key household decision maker. Emmanuel, household people, devices, all three, what, what are you selling from an addressable point of view? Um, um, in fact, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's very true what you are saying. This is the, the reason why uh, in France, and I'm, I'm sure we are not the only one, uh, all other countries are, are working on, on that, is that um, today uh, the mediametry, which is the, the TV audience measurement, is uh, working very closely and partnering with uh, ISPs, uh, so operators that have that, that set-top box, in order to, uh, to, uh, to create a uh, hybrid measurement uh, uh, that combine ISP's log data with panel data. And the, the idea uh, behind, uh, of course, is to be able to probabilize uh, uh, household audience uh, into individual audience. And the other thing and the, the idea behind, of course, is to be uh, able to uh, measure a campaign, whatever, uh, whatever the, the device. Uh, maybe th there is just one thing I, I, I would like to, uh, to add um, uh, in uh, the different way we are using the, the data, and I was fully agree with what you're saying. In fact, uh, uh, using the data is not only for targeting. Uh, of course, it is for uh, targeting, and so uh, now it's a long time that we can uh, target, uh, uh, use data to target around our uh, non-linear contents, and now uh, it's a, a little bit recent in France, it's about uh, since um, eight, uh, 18 months ago, uh, we can also target around linear content with uh, addressable TV, TV that have just been launched. launched. But uh, uh, in fact, we, we also can use the data in order to, to optimize traditional TV buying. And in fact, uh, in France, uh, traditional TV buying uh, is still where uh, advertisers put the largest part of their, uh, of their budget. And, uh, and right now, we, we, we are working a lot in what, what we call data planning. So it's to optimize your TV plan, not on socio demo, but on data segments. And for instance, for, for a car manufacturer, it makes a lot of sense to optimize its TV plan not on uh, 25 to, uh, to 59 uh, years, uh, years old male, but to optimize it on people that are actually in the market and that intend to, uh, to purchase a car. And we see that optimizing uh, traditional TV plans with, uh, with, that, uh, with data, first of all, uh, generate much more sales, but also is very efficient in recruit, recruiting new customers for, for the brand. And, and we know that uh, the key objective of, uh, of television is to, is to recruit. So what I really think is that there are many, many ways to use the data. Uh, it's not opposite. Uh, using the data for uh, targeting and using the data for uh, traditional uh, TV. And even I, I, I would say, according to me, it would be a, a mistake to decide uh, to use the data only for targeting because, um, in fact, people that purchase your product are, are not the one you think they are. And so if you decide to target only people that you think are your, your core targets, you will miss out a, a large part of your potential buyers. And this is the reason why I, I think that the best mix is to use the data to optimize your traditional TV buying and to use it to target uh, to, for, in uh, addressable TV to target your core target with dedicated uh, message. This is just uh, what I wanted to add. <laughs> I think I think that's absolutely brilliant. I just loved all that. I wish I wish we had recorded it. Really recorded <laughs> I'm it. sure I'm someone has. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say on this point about you know the complexity of of um, you know individual versus household versus you know everything else. I think I think sometimes we just need to take a step 
back a little bit because if we go so deep into the technology and the mechanics of how everything works, I think we can, you know, we, we can almost um, stagnate you know, we think, okay, we can't actually do any of this until we've sorted out all of these mechanics and we know exactly when we are targeting a user. I think <coughs> advertising for the 150 years or whatever that it's been around has, you know, it's always been about investment in the opportunity to reach uh, a user that would be a potential customer. And there, there are a range of reasons why you want to do that, build brand awareness, uh, increase consideration, actually a call to action. But there's always been an element of probability in that, right? There's always been an element sure. of whether or not the, the, the ad is, is seen, whether it's out of home, newspaper, et cetera. Now, the big data capabilities that have come in have really increased the probability, right? I mean, I think we'll never get to 100%, but it's getting, it's getting better and better. Um, and on that point about you know, household versus uh, uh, profiles, yes, I think there's a lot going on behind the scenes technology. You know, for example, we are, we are looking at introducing profiles, et cetera, so we can get, increase that probability even more. But I, it's important to remember that we do have a, a portfolio of tools. So for example, by, by, by marrying up sort of data-driven as in ID-based uh, targeting, deterministic targeting with contextual targeting, for example, or kind of some of the you know, content-based uh, uh, targeting capabilities that we have, we can get much closer to understanding who our users are. Well, and there's a famous quote, isn't there? We shouldn't let the impossibility of perfection stand in the way of the pursuit of better, Absolutely. which is where we're going. But I would like to talk quickly about data quality. So there's a sense, I think, if you read the trade press, that we're overselling the quality of the data to some extent. And I don't know how many people here have come across companies like Truthset or Neutronian in the US who are data quality companies. They will use various different methodologies to vet the quality of the data that's being used for targeting purposes. And obviously they have a vested interest in demonstrating that data quality is often poor, but some of the results from the quality checks they run on data, certainly for certain segments, suggest that data quality is uniformly woeful. In other words, we've kind of sold advertisers on this vision of hyper-accurate, deterministic, census-level data. But actually a lot of the data is very poor quality. It's out of date. That it's spoof email addresses. I mean, let's start with you down there, Guy. Is there a data quality problem we need to be aware of? Does the industry have sufficiently robust processes in place to vet the quality of the data we're using for targeting? Uh, that's a good question. I think, I think from our perspective, we, we'd feel very confident in the quality of our customer data because it's obviously refreshed on a monthly basis. We have a billing relationship with those customers. Because okay, your, your data, in a sense, the, the data that a, sub, a subscription pay TV business has, like yours, is kind of gold standard. That's right. a triple-A tranche of data. And that's the foundation of a lot of our campaigns. As I say, I think you know, more than half of, of the addressable campaigns we serve have a geographical element. Um, we partner with, with companies like Experian that provide the Mosaic data, which I think is pretty high standard, pretty yep. well accepted across the industry. I think there is a, there is a challenge in terms of permissions and, and, and walled gardens around data that exists for very good reason that perhaps prevents some of the scrutiny that you might otherwise be able to, to look at. I think there's always going to be a danger in advertising solutions in that you're, you're working with people who do promotion for a living and they perhaps might overstate the, uh, the capabilities or the effectiveness of what they do. I think, I think it's right to be aware of it. And I think, you know, buyer beware from all of these sorts of things. I think there's, there's some things that definitely sound too good to be true in terms of their capability. OK, Joe, you work with lots of advertiser first party data assets. And I guess advertisers like to come to you with their nice shiny data from their CRM and customer data systems. And I'm guessing you then have a good look at that data and start thinking about matching with audiences and so on. Are advertiser first party data assets generally high quality or is a lot of it low quality subprime data? Um, in, in, in the most, it's yeah, high quality. This is, you know, this is deterministic data that they're, they're, they're yielding from their customers. And a lot of that is kind of transactional data, which, you know, a, a, across the industry, we know to be of, of, of high quality. Um, I welcome, you know, the, the introduction of, of, of companies like, uh, like you mentioned to kind of have a look at the, the, the quality of these data sets. Um, 
across the board, not just on kind of, you know, the CRM, uh, CRM data, although the advertisers themselves would have to be working with those companies, but within the other kind of the, the, the other data partners and data segmentations that exist. From a fine cast perspective, um, we're part of the WPP family, so this sort of thing is taken uber, uber seriously, and as a result of that, we, we, we really do only partner with um, quality, renowned and established um, data partners and two, broad, two sides of the spectrum there, one being Experian as well, we work with them, but then on, on, on kind of the, the pointier end, Nectar, so, you know, it, it, and, and we make sure, I don't know if there's any partners in the room, but they will be able to tell you that there are many, many um, hoops that they have to jump through in terms of vetting that data to ensure that we're giving our clients, you know, a, a, a credible product. Okay, Sam, final question to you on the data quality issue. Yep. You know, Magnet obviously works across lots of different media. Yeah. Do, any views on data quality? Is there anything so, to worry about here or not so much? So, I mean, you're right, we work across a whole host of different uh, organisations, particularly on the supply side. So, you know, we've got broadcasters and operators um, that have their first party data that you would expect to be pretty high quality. Um, and then sitting in the middle of those is also uh, we work with a, a lot of device manufacturers and OEMs, um, and they obviously have a vast amount of ACR data um, for them to, uh, to to utilize. So, you know, that is massively uh, powerful data to be able to use and optimize and sell against, um, and that is incredibly accurate because they can see what's happening on the glass level of the screen. So can I say one thing please. about quality? Sorry, yes. finish, finish. No, no, first. if Sam's finished, please. <laughs> Go then I'm going to talk to Manuel about attribution. I, I, think, um, I think we just need to be careful when we have blanket statements like the data quality is bad. Sorry, data person, data hat on. <laughs> um, you know, when we think about quality in data, we need to think about it kind of end to end. So a lot of what we're talking about is quality of the source data product, uh, source data rather. So the data at the point of collection or, you know, wh or when the user is voluntarily sharing it with us due to the value exchange. And the quality there, you know, as, as someone's already said, you know, if it's a transactional relationship, you know, they're, they're more likely to give you true data. But data quality goes all the way downstream as well. So how the data is, the data that's collected, how is it then processed? How is it then um, modeled? You know, and there's data quality issues around modeling as well, around accuracy and things like that. And then how it's then um, pushed out into activation platforms. You know, things like uh, match rates and kind of issues with data leakage and things like that. So I think when we when we talk about data quality, we need to think about it end to end. And and that's what I was trying to get it with the processes point because. Yes. A lot of this is relatively new to TV. Ten years ago, we were not talking about clean rooms, and clean rooms are there to match data, and often the match rates aren't high. They can be low. Yeah, and I, I do think there are, you know, there's a capability that platforms and technologies out there, like some of the companies you mentioned, but a lot of, a lot of it, again, with data hat on and kind of building out a data platform and data tools and capabilities, is about the principle that you know, the principles that you use to develop the asset, right? So you're going in, at ITV, we're going in, we're building out a data platform with privacy, quality, security, by design, which means it only goes into the platforms if we're, if we're sure that it's, it's, it's up to scratch. And then every step of that process, there are, there are kind of principles and mechanics in place that need to be followed, alerts in place if something were to fall over. So I think it's just, you know, yes, I think the capability is there, but there also needs to be the will and, the, you know, a set of principles around the people and processes that work with the data to ensure that, you know, that, that quality all the way through. Agreed. And I think it's, it's making Sorry, sure there's process. I went more than a minute there. No, that's <laughs> fine. Don't worry. You can see um, I'm a bit passionate about this topic. You, you've concealed it well, um, or not at all. Um, Emmanuel, let's talk about attribution quickly, because I know this is one of your pet topics. T -t Tell us why in your view, data-driven attribution, matching an exposure to an outcome is such an important part of this story. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, um, as I told earlier, at Canal Plus, we, we are both a broadcaster, but also a distributor with our own set-top box. And uh, in fact, it's about, yes, th three, three years, something like that, that, that we started to, uh, to match all the data collected through our uh, uh, millions of uh, set-top box of our subscribers with uh, third-party data, uh, most of the time with the, the, uh, the advertisers' CRM data, but also uh, other sources of, of data. And uh, by matching all the data with the 
the overall TV viewing uh, of our subscribers with third party data. What we could do is first of all to identify all ad breaks that on our channels that uh, over index against specific segments uh, for, uh, for the clients and segments that make sense to them uh, in terms of, of business. What, uh, what we, we do also is exactly what you said, uh, uh, measuring, in fact, uh, in fact, the effectiveness of, uh, of its, uh, its campaign by uh, comparing the purchase behavior between actual exposed versus non-exposed people. And uh, we, always, uh, we also um, go a, a step further by identifying, in fact, time slots and uh, contexts that overperform in driving sales uh, for the clients. And so it's not exactly uh, what, we, um, what we think about uh, attribution in digital because it's not about uh, in-flight optimization. We are here uh, for a use for traditional TV uh, campaign, but uh, all the insights that we get, uh, we use it to optimize, in fact, uh, the, the forthcoming uh, campaign. And what we are working right now is that, um, is, um, sorry, um, what, what we are doing right now is to consider not only uh, uh, KPI that are connected to sales, because um, although our clients are obsessed by uh, their short time, uh, by, by short, short, uh, short term uh, incomes, uh, we are really convinced that, in fact, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the performance of TV should not be limited to short sales income. And it's very uh, important to, uh, to include and to take into account also branding indicators because it's the brand in, uh, equity that actually built long-term sales. And right now we are partnering with a research company in order to match actual exposures collected uh, from our setup box we survey data in order to to integrate also branding indicators in uh, in this approach so, joe in the digital industry there's, there's been a kind of long-standing concern about kind of last click attribution and whether that correctly <coughs> attributes value do you think there's a risk that data-driven attribution in the tv space leads us down the same path Yes, and, and, and it, it shouldn't. No, no. But in fact, uh, TV is, a, is is an amazing media to uh, to to build awareness and, and to build a brand equity. And uh, if you if you uh, use the media only to focus to short term sales, uh, I think uh, it will be very diff <laughs> it will be very dangerous for for your brand. Okay. So I think uh, it would be a great mistake only to measure the impact uh, uh, of TV uh, on only on short term. Uh, Joe, I guess you'd agree. I, I I would definitely agree on that. I think it goes back to the quote of um, not letting kind of perfection get in the way of, of doing better. I think, you know, TV over a long period of time has proven the um, uplifting sales, you know, through, through kind of um, t advertising over a, p a period of time. Um, and I think, you know, if we look at that, the last click attribution side of things, there's, there's, there's challenges that exist within the TV landscape right now to, to kind of fully go one to one. But we can go one to few now. And I think looking at that measurement across geographical spaces um, it, it, it is ultimately what you like to see. So what we, we do with a lot of our brands is be able to tell, tell you the uplift of awareness, intent, or in, in fact sales um, within a geographical region. And sometimes that's as, as, as low as a postcode. So you're still, you're still getting a very finite look on the impact of your, your addressable TV advertising there. We are heading perilously close towards lunch, and I can hear the grumbling of empty stomachs coming from the audience. So let's move into a very quick fire question round. Um, Lara, you mentioned clean rooms earlier. Yes. Is clean room infrastructure ready for prime time in the TV space, or are we still in test and learn? So I don't think there is a finish line, right? I think in this industry, if we're not taking the view, taking the mindset that we're always testing and learning, then we're in big trouble, because as someone already mentioned, it's in the gaffer's DNA to think that way. Um, our personal, so from ITV perspective, we've, um, we've been working with our partner InfoSum for over a year. We've had 
a data match um, product out, out in market with a dozen or so advertisers as part of our pilot. Anyone who had heard, seen Reese's presentation would have seen it has been a huge success um, and it has enabled the collaboration that's allowed us to be a lot more innovative. You know, I think, you know, th this whole session seems to be about collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I think the data clean room technology allows us to properly collaborate. Uh, um, and the reason why it's allowed us to do this and, it, and we haven't been able to do it effectively before is I think the clean room technology is basically systematizing trust. So where, you know, we were, you know, we were worried about uh, data leakage of our own of our own data sets, or potentially another partner misusing our data. The clean room technology kind of takes that away by kind of making trust kind of as part of the system. So I think I think it's a, I think it's it's kind of hugely important hugely important to you know kind of ensuring the sustainability of our business because I think data collaboration collaboration in general, but data collaboration in particular is is going to underpin a lot of kind of how we how we move forward in in this industry okay we have got five minutes left so why don't we talk about the future actually why don't we talk quickly about intermediaries first because we have two on the table whenever this topic comes up somebody will start getting worried about the ad tech tax um sam are we white to be worried about the ad tech tax i mean in other words i feel uh, like um, you added this after we had drinks last night and i, I did you um, not at all somehow um <laughs> this is why i'm being asked this question but um I mean, we, are, we offer a huge amount of value, um, obviously. Um, so, um, Mag and I work with a whole host of different organizations, and a lot are moving from subscription models, transactional models, um, from uh, device manufacturer businesses, uh, and, and, and often into this advertising world. And so, we are there to uh, support them from an operational standpoint, like helping them navigate this sometimes quite complex world. Um, from a technology standpoint, uh, to ensure that we invest in the right products for them to execute programmatic deals and direct deals within our platform. And then on the buy side, a lot of education on CTV and addressable TV, it's a very new area, right? So the buy side are trying to get to grips with it and understand how that works and operates. So we spend a huge amount of time with the brands explaining uh, what it's all about and educating them on that and bringing those two together. Um, from an operational standpoint, let alone the amount that we invest in technology, John, we do a lot of good things. Excellent answer. <laughs> and I wasn't upset over dinner. It was absolutely <laughs> fine. Three bottles of wine. It was a very nice dinner. It's not, it was a very nice dinner. <laughs> right. Um, let's start with Guy, and we're going to talk about the future. So it's 2025. Tell us what's going to look most different in this space. We've had a quick race through where we're at and talked about some of what's working well, and there seems to be quite a lot working well. Three years from now, what's going to look most different in terms of targeting in the Rambo TV space? Yeah, I think future gazing is always a, a kind a of... A mugs game. Yeah, mugs game indeed. Um, I think my view from a, from a viewer's experience, I, I hope they won't, they won't see an enormous amount of difference. Right. I, think, I think what we're trying to, to manage is, is um, the inflation in the cost of, of content creation and, and, and trying to balance that against you know stacking more adverts into that. So um, hopefully more more relevant, less disruptive advertising adverts right. that they are less likely to tune away with and, and, and more more inclined to engage with and perhaps you know actually interact with. Um, but I think behind the scenes probably more complexity. Um, I think how we resolve data sharing, data matching, you know, enabling um, proper uh, attribution and uh, incremental reach measurement across different platforms and different kind of currently walled gardens, closed shops or whatever. I think that's something that I hope we get to grips with more in the next few years. Um, okay. And how we educate viewers, I think, on, on what we're doing with that data and kind of why not to be afraid of that and it's how it's not for nefarious means it's, it's to improve that experience for them fingers crossed joe 2025 what looks different yeah i firstly the the term intermediaries on the previous question i would challenge from a fine class <laughs> perspective we definitely and our clients see us as an integrator don't have enough time to go into that but if you'd like to talk to me then i'm I, i'm more than happy to answer in terms of 25 i will again evangelize because predicting is a mug's game um i think we're probably going to see continued fragmentation of the platforms and the audiences we that then go goes across um i hope that we so therefore i see more 
investment in companies that will be able to kind of um, reach those audiences across those fragmenting platforms. Um, I hope to see more practicality in the, um, in the advertising that we provide, um, and that will be driven by, by data decisioning. So shameless plug, but um, Dynamic Creative is a really interesting part of it. I know ITV work with that, and, and Finecast are, are also um, testing and learning in that space. So it would be really interesting to see how we can do that. And then on, on the shoppable ads side of things, I think right. that's going to be really interesting. I think we have to be careful of not cooking the golden goose, though, okay. and not to disturb our, our audience viewership. Emmanuel, you've got 10 seconds, 2025. OK, um, we are looking very closely what, what's going to, to happen with uh, Netflix and Disney, uh, and Disney, Disney Plus that will uh, open to advertising. So, of course, it will uh, boost uh, advertising, uh, connected TV advertising, but also it might challenge all, all our current positions. And the last thing, maybe I'm just wondering whether uh, tomorrow the, the audience of uh, the, the value of a program uh, will continue to be defined by, by its audience and its audience on, uh, on different age break, or it will be the value of a program will be defined by its efficiency uh, to reach very specific segment for, for the brand. Right. And so okay. what I think is that it might disrupt a little bit audience measurement companies. Interesting. They're already being disrupted, but let's see. Sam, I super have one fast. second. Data Pretty collaboration much. is what I'm hoping for uh, moving forward. Laura, one word. Same. Data Same. collaboration <laughs> to drive innovation. I know. Wonderful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that brings our panel to a close. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you at lunch. <laughs>